Thank you so much, Jay. One of my favorite humans, <clears throat> slash interdimensional beings, slash aliens. <laughs> How's that volume? That okay? Yep. Good morning, everybody. Some familiar faces and some new smiles. Thank you so much for coming out this morning. I always like to start uh, with a custom that we have in Australia. If you're gathering anywhere to share wisdom and to be together and um, to share knowledge and just basically hang out and do some good stuff, we like to do a welcome to country. If you're of that indigenous area, if you're an Aboriginal of that tribe, they call it a welcome to country. If you're not from that tribe, they call it an acknowledgement of country. And so I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country here and if you'd like to, you can even just close your eyes. We'd like to thank the traditional custodians of this land, the Dakota Sioux and the Ojibwe tribes. I'd like to thank the current custodians of this land, Lake Harriet Spiritual Community, Nancy and Gary and Jay, and everyone else that does so much to be able to give us this opportunity here today. And I'd like to thank all of you, because if you didn't come, we wouldn't have a purpose here in this building. So just really thanking this piece of land here, the traditional custodians, current custodians, and future. Thank you, you can open your eyes. Let's get going. <laughs> As usual, the only challenge I'm gonna to have today is kind of trying to fit it all in. So I was thinking of locking the doors and just staying here with you until about midday, but I think I'm gonna to try to keep it under wraps. If we could grab the PowerPoint, please. If it's still around. So I've been living here for a couple of years now. I'm originally from Sydney, Australia. Originally trained as a veterinary surgeon um, in Sydney. And now I work uh, with Dr. Joe Dispenza, teaching and sharing his incredible work. Uh, hands up who's heard of him, yeah? Yeah, cool, great. It's amazing, amazing to see how far his work is reaching now. I will tell you a little secret, he's not going to be teaching in the current form much longer. He's changing the way he teaches in 2018. So if there's any way you can get to one of his workshops, both what they call the progressive and the advanced, get your butts there, run, don't walk, see if you can get there. He's an extraordinary teacher and the way that he's teaching at the moment isn't going to be around for much longer, so see if you can dive in. So we've got the beautiful community here. Uh, that every month chooses a theme for us and um, they sit around and nut it out and this month they've called it Nurturing the Soul, an invitation to consider that. So I really wanted to kind of, uh, we're kicking it off this month, this weekend, and I wanted to talk about these things that we sort of talk about as moments of awakening. There's a quote from my teacher and mentor and buddy, Dr. Joe Dispenza, and he says, we can change in times of pain or suffering or we can change in times of joy and inspiration. I choose joy. And, but it's easy enough to say that, right? If change was easy, everyone would be doing it. So on the 1st of January 2006, I just wanted to share a little bit of story with you to let you know why um, I love this process and why I might know a little bit about it. I woke up, or I didn't even wake up, I just found myself sitting on the end of my bed. I'd been out of my body, I'd not been asleep, and I was sitting there on the 1st of January on the end of my bed, and I'd arrived back in my body. A couple of weeks later, I'd seen a movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? Who's seen that? Probably all of you who know about Dr. Joe. Great, if you haven't seen it, see it. Uh, if you haven't seen it, please jump online and have a look. You can stream it from places. Uh, it's an amazing port of call for those people who are interested in finding out more about both how you work and how the universe works around you. <clears throat> so I'd seen that movie a couple of weeks before and in this experience that I had when I was not awake and not asleep and not in my body, I was flying over my entire life like a bird's eye view from beginning to end. And as I was looking down on all of the relationships and all of the experiences, I began to see all of the patterns. The same people showing up in my life whether I was a small child whether I was a teenager moving into adult in college or after. The same types of people, the same personalities, the same patterns of relationships and experiences. I was floating above my life and I saw this common thread through all of it. And that common thread was me. 
I was the one thing that was t showing up in every experience, even though the people might have changed or the, or the relationships might have changed. Do so you guys know what I mean? This experience of the hamster wheel. So I realized that I was the only one responsible for what had been happening and I was the only one responsible for the potential to change. And during that experience, I heard a voice and it was a statement from the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? And it said, in this infinite sea of potentials, why do we keep recreating the same realities over again and over again? So I had had this experience where I sort of woke up out of some kind of sleep, out of some kind of confusion, with a moment of clarity. And these moments of clarity happen in a way that you can't forget. You know, you have these epiphanies or these realizations and they seem to come out of nowhere and they often hit you like a freight train. Has anyone had that experience happen in their life? Yeah? A couple of those moments where all the questions you were wondering about suddenly become clear or all the answers you were searching for suddenly come to fruition. And you think it's going to be amazing, but it's actually a huge amount of responsibility. It's actually sometimes quite overwhelming. And so what I wanted to talk about was this nature of the soul the fact that it wants to awaken, it's calling you to awaken and it's going to happen anyway. The question is, are you listening? Can you hear it? And what will you do when you enter into conversation with it? <clears throat> A few years later in 2011, I went to see Dr. Joe Dispenza. And I was in an auditorium similar to this, and Dr. Joe at that time was teaching what he calls a level one, a level two. And it was a really sort of early parts of his work, and there's a section of his workshop where he shows some videos. And I had another moment of a very powerful realization. And it changed my life, and it changed the direction that I was headed in. And I wanted to share that video with you today. So if we could grab that. Desktop video, thanks, John. It's an old video, so it wasn't very bright. But the athlete, Heather Dornadon, had fallen, tripped over um, the foot of the person in front of her, and gotten up, and she was so far behind, and she came back to win the race. And I was watching that, and we had about 100 people in um, the theater with Dr. Joe. And I started to cry. And it was, the, it was one of about probably seven or eight videos that he was showing us. And I didn't just start crying a little bit. I started ugly crying. So I had tears like flowing like a waterfall, like Niagara Falls out my eyes. I had snot pouring down. I couldn't keep it in. And I could feel something shifting energetically inside me and I couldn't stop crying. And if you've ever been to see Dr. Joe, he's really well known for getting you to talk to your neighbor about everything that he's addressing. And so he's like, talk to your neighbor and I'm like, I cannot even speak. I couldn't speak. I was sobbing and sobbing for about an hour and a half, for about 90 minutes. And Joe kept teaching and kept talking, and I could not stop crying. Eventually, I had to leave the room, and I came back in. Something in me had moved and shifted. And I realized that watching that race, I thought I had gotten up in my life. I'd watched my mum suffer from alcoholism and depression and uh, die from cancer. And so as I watched her as I was growing up, I was so determined not to be her, not to fall down the way that she had fallen down. And I felt as I watched that video that she had fallen down and never gotten up. And I thought I was running my race. I thought I'd gotten up. But I realized that I'd been walking. I realized I'd made sure that I wouldn't go down the path she was going down, but I still wasn't m moving as fast and as, as strongly as I could. Do you guys know what I mean? Like, I knew that I'd made some changes, but I was nowhere near expressing the fullness of my potential. I was walking, and I was letting everybody carry on with the race, and I was in the victim mode and saying, it's okay, guys, at least I'm not going to fall down. I'm not an alcoholic but I'm just gonna stay here and not do much else than not be an alcoholic, you know? And the power of that awakening was so profound for me that I ended up following this work. 
And I have ended up going and working with Dr. Joe Dispenza. And I've ended up diving down the rabbit hole into these moments of awakening. The evolutionary process that every one of us goes through individually and as a collective is not this linear process from beginning to end that biology wants us to think it is, right? This went around a couple of years ago, it always cracks me up. Go back, we've messed everything up, he says. And then a whole bunch of people put out these other memes with things on this side suggesting what might be representing the downfall of humanity. So the first one was Justin Bieber, and so, poor guy. And then the Kardashians and all that kind of stuff. So they were saying, listen, we need to try again. But it's not this linear progress. We're not waiting for ourselves to grow a tail or to evolve in some biological way. Our evolution now is up to us. Our personal evolution is a choice of consciousness. And it's up to us to begin to make those choices and decisions for ourselves. <clears throat> Other than Dr. Joe Dispenza, one of my greatest teachers is a woman called Michelle Richmond. And she was the one that started to talk to me about this idea of the, the evolution of human consciousness. Who's heard of this Hawkins map of human consciousness before? A couple of people. It's beautiful, great work. And what it's talking about is that there's this evolution really in the emotional state of humans. In the, these are, um, goes from shame, guilt, apathy, grief, fear, desire, anger, pride, courage, neutrality. So you begin to reach sort of a neutral experience here willingness, acceptance, reason to love, joy, peace, and enlightenment. And what we do is have a look at this as a scale from negative to positive. Uh, Hawkins actually mapped the energetic frequencies of it, um, and there's associated emotional states with it. So she didn't go too much detail. What she was just saying is there's an evolutionary process going on. She put it beside this pendulum-like experience and began to describe my personal evolution. Rather than hoping that I'm in sort of these negative states and once I awaken or once I you know, have my realizations, everything's gonna be great. You know, It's all gonna be good once I just realize this one thing or make this one change. But instead, she wanted me to love myself and my process and start to understand it's never gonna end. It just depends on how you perceive your situation. So we, have, we, we start to look at ourselves through this pendulum-like idea, and this thing down the middle is this constant stream that's always there, that's the truth of who you are. Okay, this is this light coming from a source, coming from this quantum field, and it's always perfect, and it's always amazing, and it's who you truly are. But once you come down into this physical body, you begin to come to experience a world of contrast. It's just the nature of this space-time reality. It's just what happens here on the planet, right? But initially, we're very clear that there are positive and negative experiences in our life. And we begin to experience life in the positive. I was really proud of myself for doing this animation. Check that out. It's pretty good. I might go back just to show it to you once again. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Um, so we have this concept that life is made of these positive and negative experiences, right? And while you're growing up and beginning to learn about yourself and the world around you, most of the experiences are stuck in that lower level. And many people will, ex will describe their life as this sort of out of control swing from everything's amazing to everything's terrible. You know, And if you took this experience of positive to negative, positive to negative, and put it on an axis with time along the bottom, you'd get that sort of roller coaster experience of life. Has anyone ever experienced that sort of human capacity to just go up and down constantly and just wonder when it's going to stop? Or say, how can I get off this, right? But we don't want you to want to get off. We want you to understand it's just part of a process. So instead of sitting down in this lower level, people begin to rise up. Did you see that? That was amazing. We, think, we talk about this spiral nature of evolution. 
all right? And I don't want you to think that you have to sit down here, but something's got to wake you up. This is your soul. This is the light of who you are, and it's always calling you to wake up. But instead of it being this kind of linear process where you have to climb a mountain, there's this pulse between these experiences of you as a human being, and I want you guys to fall in love with that. If most of humanity, by the way, is still kind of spinning around in these lower emotions and these lower frequencies, and then you begin to have awakening experiences, and it's this upward spiral. Now, if this is the truth of who you are, and you begin to have most of your awakening processes from a negative experience, right? So most people will wake up because of trauma, a disease diagnosis, the loss of a loved one. Something intense will happen that will force them to ask the questions. And so then they start to ask questions and they gain information and you come and cycle back around because you feel like you're starting to understand a little bit more. You're getting a few answers. And everyone thinks that this is where life is going to end. For the, you know, that's it, I've worked it out, I'm going to stay here. But it's not what happens. And if you knew that's not what happens, then it would be okay because you'd start to get excited. What happens is you find out more and the soul says, I'm ready for the next journey. I'm ready for the next creative process. Show me what's next. And you begin then to go into a state of unknown. You start to learn again. And you're challenged and something new begins to teach you a new lesson. And once you understand and receive that information, you begin to feel better, right? And you're like, oh my gosh. So you're living in these higher levels. And what happens is the, the further you evolve, the further your soul evolves, the less extreme these experiences are. So you kind of, life starts to get a little bit more kind of manageable. Yeah? You're still having you know, positive and negative experiences, which you might associate or call good or bad, but at least you're starting to be able to manage them. Sometimes some people feel like they fall back down to who they were, and they start to say, and I coach this work, and I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, and I know a lot of you here are healers, and you see this, and you witness this transformation for people. Some people go back and they come in and they're like, I thought I'd changed, but I haven't. I've been drinking again. And I say, well, how long were you drinking this time? And they say, three days. And I'm like, that's amazing, because it used to be a month before you caught yourself and you pulled yourself out and your awareness began to change and choose who you wanted to be. Does that make sense for you guys? So you want to be, this is a, a self-love and a self-forgiveness process of self-evolution. Now, most of the time, your soul's going to be kind of train wrecking you if you don't start to pay attention. It wants you to wake up. And what happens as you uh, travel further up this process is, first of all, these extremes get less and less. But also, if you're down here and, you're, and the pendulum of your life experience is swinging from negative to positive, how often are you passing through a sense of who you truly are? Like, you know, not very regularly. It's once every now and then you sort of have this sense of peace or reconnection to yourself. But as your life is up here and you're starting to realize who you are and how powerful your thoughts are and what you can do to change yourself, you spend more and more time getting glimpses of your true nature. Does that make sense for you guys? Yeah? So you start to do things like practice meditation to choose to experience this. What you don't want is for the pendulum to stop and just sit there, you know? That's, you're already this coming from source. You're here on the planet to experience this contrast. And so this, I loved learning about this sort of spiral nature of it. And I started to think about, after I'd had many of these experiences, the difference that happens between when life is happening to you down here and these extreme events versus our choice to evolve. So in your brain and body, we have these primitive brain parts at the back, the reptilian system and the emotional system in the middle. Very primitive survival-based functions. Our evolution is to move from fear and survival, that says, 
to fascination in creation, from fear to fascination, from survival to creation. That is our evolution, and we have all the hardware to do it. We've got all the brain structures we need to go through the awakening process. The problem is, you have to choose to use them. Every single one of you has that frontal lobe, this part of the brain right behind your forehead that is the seat of human evolution. Every single one of you has it. Question is, do you use it, right? Because this frontal lobe is a superpower and it can make thought more real than anything else. This frontal lobe can make uh, thought so real that your brain and body believe it's happening now. So you can create an inner world that represent, represents an experience and your brain and body don't know the difference between something that's actually happening in your external reality or something you're fabricating by thought alone. To the brain and the body it's the same thing. But switching this part of your brain on is absolutely essential and you're the only one that can do it. And meditation is one of the most proven ways that we have found to literally take this muscle of self-creation to the gym. Aerobic exercise also has been shown to turn the frontal lobe on. So even though we have these parts of our brain, remember, we're a consciousness using a brain and a body. We're a greater awareness, non-local, not bound to the biology of us. We're a consciousness using a brain and a body, and we have the hardware. So the soul, the consciousness, is always asking you to come on this incredible ride here in this life that you've chosen. And it wants you to wake up, and it's going to show you and kick you up the butt until you start to move. And when you start to move and you understand, you can start to literally determine what part of the brain you're using, how your genes are turning on and off, then things get really fun. What if instead of calling this positive and negative, we began to call it the known and the unknown? What if instead of calling this the positive and the negative, we called it the familiar and the new? And we began to choose our awakening. We began to choose these processes because we're curious because we're fascinated and we're not afraid of a challenge or something that might be frightening, which is just the unknown. What if we called this mastery and we called this the initiations? And you just realize that over your entire lifetime, everything is going to be an experience of either learning something new and really starting to feel like you've got it you know, and then the soul's gonna say, oh, wow, you've got wealth, you've mastered wealth. What about relationships, how are they going? Let's start working on that. And then you start to learn new things. You start to choose it instead of it happening to you. That really is the process that's happening on the planet at the moment. So it all sounds well and good, but how do we do it? I've got a question here, what does it feel like when everything you thought you knew to be real changes beyond doubt. What does it feel like to have those awakening experiences? What does it feel like to see something you've never seen before? Have you guys ever sort of been uh, told someone you'd meet them somewhere, you know? And so you're standing where you're supposed to meet them and you're looking all over the place and then all of a sudden you realize they're right next to you. Has that happened to anyone? You've been looking for something and all of a sudden it's right in front of your eyes. In the most recent workshop with Dr. Joe Dispenza in Florida, I had one of the most profound meditation experiences I've ever had in my life. I've been working with him now for close to 10 years. And he is so committed to every person finding the power of themselves and their ability to choose their awakening. But he's also committed to grounding the understanding of what's happening, to make this process a well-documented path of how you can choose to wake up. So he has these extraordinary tools and processes and techniques that we use to incite the awakening process in the brain, to turn on the pineal gland, to change your brain chemistry so you can start to see beyond this dimension. 
And by the way, I'm trained as a vet, so I have a solid scientific background. And I have had the most profound interdimensional experiences going down wormholes. I've had experiences in um, other dimensions with other beings. And I've had this so many times, and I've understood how to get there and why this happens, that it's becoming fantastically familiar. But the most re and, and so I'd been having them for a little while, and I study it, and I practice it, and it started to become familiar. And in the, in the retreat down in Tampa, Dr. Joe kept using this language. There's always more love. There's always more adventure. There's always a deeper experience to have. But who we are, as we evolve upwards, needs to be able to integrate our understanding and live and work with that first before you can kind of dive into the next one, because otherwise your system kind of gets shot, you know, filled with way too much electricity and you can't cope and everything goes really weird. So we want to have these experiences, but never think that you've arrived at the final destination point. You want to fall in love with this extraordinary journey. <clears throat> I was so moved by what had happened that there were some real key points, and that's why I was excited to be able to share it with you guys. A lot of the work that we're famous for with Dr. Joe's is what's called mental rehearsal. Some people call it creative visualization, but it's not just about visualizing. It's literally about creating your own reality. And it doesn't matter whether you create your own reality as a wealthy person or a healthy person or someone who's having a mystical or an awakening experience. You guys can choose your awakening by just wondering what that might feel like, right? Has everyone used sort of visualization tools in their own life? Yeah, where you close your eyes and you go inwards and you think and feel what it would be like to be in that experience. But most of us are either trying to change our health or create wealth or create success or a relationship, yeah? But you can do it with an emotional experience of what it might be like to awaken. It's so interesting and it really doesn't get much more complicated than that. So the experience that I had when I was meditating down in, in Tampa was, um, was so profound that I became obsessed with these videos when I got back. And I wanted to share a couple of them with you and then take you through a short practice before we end today, just because it's gonna be fun. Does that sound good? So when you have a brain in your head at the moment, it's wired to reflect everything you already know. Your brains are a record of your past. Your brain wires itself by the thoughts it thinks over your lifetime. And every single one of you is sitting here with a brain that represents every thought you've already thought. So in order to have these new experiences, we have to be ready for the unknown. Okay, and what Dr. Joe does is he sort of builds a model and invites us to imagine how it might feel and think. And when I got home and I saw these videos, they were the closest thing that I could find to the experience I'd had in Tampa. When I closed my eyes and there was the most extraordinary uh, interdimensional experiences of sacred geometry that wasn't just sort of a flat image, it was like made of liquid metal moving towards me. And not only were there images, but there was information that was arriving in my system at such a deep level that you can only find out what sort of what's in there once you go back to your life and you realize you're a different person. So I want to share a couple of videos with you. Thanks, John. Isn't that beautiful? Amazing, you know? And that was the closest thing I could get to describing how I felt in Tampa when I closed my eyes and I went into this world and it was more beautiful than I could ever imagine with the brain that I have. And I got there by choice, you know? There are tools and practices that allow you to choose these types of experiences. And when you come back and you open your eyes, everything is different. And it takes courage to change your world, guys. I know it'll be different and it's weird, but if we do it in community, you can call someone and go, I just had the weirdest thing, and they can say, me too, <laughs> you know? 
So I just, I really would love all of you to be curious about the process. Don't expect it always to be, you know, the easiest thing. But never stop. And if you can start to learn about yourself and learn about the brain that you have with people like Dr. Joe Dispenza, learn about the way that your body functions and also how that system interacts with this amazing world around us, you can move into this state of mastery and get excited about these initiations. I've just been through one. It was not pretty, <laughs> you know, but when I was in the middle of it, this is the phoenix setting itself on fire, right? Not catching on fire because it walked past something and burst into flames, but sitting there as a master and saying, I am ready to find out more about who I am and about what is possible on this planet and also in other realms that might be available. Does that make sense for you guys? Yeah? Did you like those videos? So beautiful, amazing. The world is amazing and things are changing. So we've got about five minutes before we're gonna do our final closing circle. And I'd like to take you through uh, what we call a rehearsal. So we use things like that to inspire us because if you've never had an awakening experience, how would you know, you know? But did you all feel something? Well, did you feel a sense of awe? My point is that every single one of those people made the decision to change their reality, but they got something physical and attached it to themselves. What if what you got was an internal process? You know, what if what you used instead of glasses or an aid was a practice that every now and then gave you glimpses of a world that eventually became familiar? So I'd like to sort of do a little practice with you now, if that's okay. Gary, could we please have some lovely music? Ooh, that sounds full on. <laughs> Get ready. Make sure you're nice and comfortable, thanks. Perfect, thanks guys. Amazing. Remember that most of your attention is in the external reality, so it means most of your energy is there. If you want to go inwards, we have to reduce the information that's coming in. Closing your eyes. Making sure you're comfortable so you don't move around and distract the mind. And then we have to give your attention something to do. So please take your attention to the heart space. Begin to notice your physical body and bring your awareness into the center of your chest. You might imagine there's a green glow in the middle of your chest or whatever color. Just feel the sensation of light and space in the center of your heart. Begin to add some breath there, breathing in as that heart space expands, allowing that space to relax as you exhale. Inhaling into the heart space, exhaling, relaxing back down. Mastering your attention. Letting go of the body, letting go of the environment, and dropping out of time for a while, just into the present moment. Breathing into the heart space. As your inner world becomes more familiar, just begin to imagine what it might feel like to suddenly see the world differently. Just play with that sensation. Imagine an epiphany or a moment of realization. Are you filled with awe? 
Are you filled with wonder? Imagine you've seen something that you've never seen before. Fill your brain and body with this experience, just by choice. And don't hold back. Oh my God, it's more incredible than I ever could have imagined. Maybe it's clarity. Maybe it's clear vision. And it's a blurry picture that suddenly comes into focus. And you just get it. There's a knowing. What would that feel like? Let that experience go now and go back to the heart space and just feel and sense that light in the center of the chest. Your attention is under your mastery. Stop generating the emotion for the moment and just feel that space at the heart. We're going to do it again in a moment. But we want to rehearse. Just the heart space. And once again, imagine you've seen something new. Can you draw on that emotion, those thoughts, those images, those sensations? Can you make it even stronger than before? Your brain and your body don't know the difference between real or imagined. Create this experience in your inner world. Use it as a magnet to draw your awakening to you. What would it be like to see God or your source? Would you be filled with joy and love? Would you be filled with gratitude? Thank you for sharing that experience. The word nurturing means to care for and encourage the growth or development of. You're the one that can nurture your soul. Your soul is always nurturing you. It's not a battle against your demons. It's an understanding of your beautiful learning process. And what you seek is seeking you. I can guarantee you that the experiences that I've been able to create, where I've connected directly to God, to other beings in these realms, where I've gone down wormholes into other dimensions, have all happened when I wasn't trying very hard. They all happened when I let go. The one in Tampa happened because uh, my fiance and I were working there with Dr. Joe and we'd been rostered on for the four hour meditation from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. That's when you do all the really good work that's supposed to kind of get you there. But we were working and I didn't do it. So I kind of went, oh well, 
I'm going to kind of let the rest of the meditations for the workshop go because I think you need all that stuff to happen in those four hours. I need to put all that effort in. Otherwise, God won't come see me, you know? And I remember going up to breakfast. We'd been up since 3 a.m. And when we went up to the breakfast and there was this giant stack of pancakes and I was like, well, since I've been up all day and I'm not going to, you know, really experience anything, I'm going to have the pancakes because, you know, and because I've been up since 3 I'm going to have the coffee because I'm probably not going to have a big meditation. Normally I don't have coffee when I meditate because it sends me right up into the beta. So I had the coffee and the pancakes and, you know, didn't do the four-hour meditation that everyone else had done. And I sat down with zero expectation. And God came at me like a freight train. And it was extraordinary. And I cannot stop remembering it and reimagining it. And I'm holding on and memorizing that experience so that I'll always know, you know. So on Tuesday nights on the first... I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for sharing your attention and your energy with me this morning, you guys. Beautiful. If you could close your eyes once again, thank you everybody, and take your awareness into that precious heart space in the center of the chest. Breathe into that heart space and breathe in gratitude. Please be thankful for yourself that you chose to come, made the effort to learn to grow. Please be thankful to yourself for all the journey that you've made in your life so far to get you to this point. Breathe in and out gratitude for the community, for the hands that you're holding, for the circle that's created here, of other adventurous souls. And please breathe in and out gratitude for this planet, for Gaia, that we be guests here on her and care for her. Beautiful. Thank you very much, everyone. You can open your eyes. Thank you for coming. Yay.